Let me just give you some background and bring you up to date with what we're done so far. In February, we were contacted by College Park, who actually operates our shuttle service here in Indianapolis. And what they shared with us is that they were having difficulty having drivers hired to run all of the shuttles, including ours. So they were going to be making a change. And they were going to be making a change that was going to cost us significantly more. And so at that time, I sent out a memo to make everybody aware that there was going to be a change or that College Park was no longer going to be doing our shuttle service. And I think, uh, very unintentionally, um, many people assumed that that meant we were doing away with the shuttle. And that is absolutely not our intention at all. But what it did is it gave us an opportunity to step back and say, let's do shuttle service the smart way. And so that's what we've done. I want you to know that the shuttle service came into being as a direct response to student needs. And we had two focus groups with students last week to share some of the data we collected and some of our thinking. And we've even made changes to the presentation here at the slide at the town hall as a result of the feedback that they gave us during those focus group meetings. So this is an opportunity for us to share with you the data we've collected, the thinking we have, the way we're leaning, and then for you to provide some feedback to us. We anticipate making a decision of which direction we're going in between May 6th and May 15th. We have to let the vendor that we, we expect that we will be going with know so that they can make sure everything is on place for the switchover in August. So with that, let me do a few thank yous before we get started. I want to thank Tony Green in the back, who is in charge of transportation, demand, transportation management on campus. I want to thank Jennifer Houlihan. She has been doing a tremendous amount of work keeping track of things and organizing and PowerPoints. Nazanin Filati is the new Vice President for Facilities and Operations, and Robert Milner, our Director for Transfer, Parking and Transportation, reports directly to her. And we could not have done any of this without Bill Crockett. Bill, just, you did a lot. <laughs> I like to make data-driven decisions, and so it was critically important for us to capture data to help us figure out which directions we wanted to go in, and Bill was just invaluable in that whole process. So with that, did I miss anybody in my thank yous? Okay. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Robert Milner, and he's going to take you through the information we collected and what we're thinking. And then we're going to come back and open it up for your reactions and questions, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. First of all, I want to welcome you also, and thank you uh, as well. So as Don said, we're going to show you some slides, we're going to give you some information, and we're going to ask for some feedback on it. So without further ado, as they say, let's go to the first slide. So this slide here, we are showing this to contrast us from College Park. A lot of people want to compare us to College Park. And this one shows that we don't have the same amount of numbers as College Park does to spread the cost across. So that's the main reason we want to show that. Everyone says, well, College Park does this. But you and me, we have a slightly uh, smaller population, as you can see there. Now, before we go into the biggest ridership, I'd like to do a little bit about background. So the data was collected on the week of March 11th through March 15th. The data was collected via a scanning app and read with our UMB One card. Which, then, which was then downloaded through an app which allowed us to do more detailed data, and that's where Bill came into the mix. It should be noted that the week of March 11th through the 15th was midterm week, and that the ridership numbers were average as far as the year before, and as well as the weeks before prior to this year and last year. So that was a good week to do the data on. So the current ridership, total ridership, is 2,388 rides, and there were 478 daily, daily rides. Let me explain the definition of a ride. A ride is every time a person enters the shuttle. If a person rides the shuttle 12 times, it was 12 rides. So if we have people in the room to get on in the morning and get on in the afternoon, that's two rides. Then you get into the, uh, well, let me back up. It's important to note that any time during the scanning or the uh, one card collection data, that if there were any errors, these were counted into the unique ridership. So we wrote them down on a piece of paper and then we had no manually entered them. 
But if we couldn't find a number for them, they counted as a unique rider set. So there were 744 total unique riders and 349 daily unique riders. So a unique rider is an individual that rode the shuttle. If one person rides the shuttle 12 times, it would still lose one ride. So again, if someone gets on the shuttle on the bio park and then gets on the federal hill, it's still one unique rider. However, it would be one unique rider for each ride. So as you can see, oh, sorry, total passengers. Our Mount Vernon leg is obviously our most heavily ridden route with a daily average ridership of about 212 passengers. Our biopark route is our least ridden route with an average daily ridership of about 29 passengers. The data also shows that the highest, the student ridership is highest on the Federal Hill route and lowest on the biopark route. Mondays are our busiest days on the Mount Vernon, Canton, and Fells Point and biopark routes, and Wednesday is the busiest for the Federal Hill route. The top hours for the routes overall are from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Unique riders. Remember what I mentioned about the unique ridership as far as the definition. So the Federal Hill route has our highest percentage of student unique riders, and the Mount Vernon route has the highest percentage of unique riders overall. Low ridership hours. This slide shows the ridership by hour. You can see the ridership peaks during the morning and then picks back up during the evening hours and drops off towards the end of the day. Has that bell curve on it twice. Student ridership by school. This slide shows the student ridership by school. The law school has one out of 10 students riding the shuttle and overall the big number is one out of every 20 uh, UMB student rides the shuttle. Ridership by affiliation. This slide shows the ridership by affiliation. Students are 52%, faculty 37, affiliate 4.5%, and other is 1.42%. Affiliate, they're contractors with the UMB1 card. This may include UMMC, FBI, and the dental school and corporate employees. Others include alumni, former employees, and visitors guests. You may remember I mentioned earlier about the biopark having the least amount of ridership. So this is a breakout of the biopark bio ridership. One can see it's extremely low on this route and actually has hours when there's actually no one on the bus at all. Current college park financial model. Before I get into the data, I want to give you a little background. The student shuttle started back in 2012 with a partnership with College Park. It was a student initiative uh, program and it started on a 10-year agreement. We are in year seventh of that agreement. There have been many ups and downs. So those of you that are familiar with the student fee transport, or student transportation fee are familiar with some of that. So there's been uh, increased cost as far as the uh, maintenance on the shuttles. There was originally proposed weekend hours. Uh, we offset the weekend hours to try to pay some of the increases in the maintenance. There were also the summer hours only included evening only, and we went to days to make sure that we compensated for everybody. And then we actually switched out the shuttles from the freight liners, which were the initial performers at about 135,000 cost, to the freight liners, which knew were 405, so our partner, uh, College Park, we were able to purchase some used ones. So now, into the numbers. So the cost of operating the shuttle under the current thing is $1.182 million. Student fees collected, 900,000. Parking and transportation, we contribute. Back in the beginning, parking and academic affairs each contribute $30,000. Again, to go back to some of those deficits that I mentioned. Currently, parking still contributes to $30,000. Then we have the administration. Let me explain back to the agreement. The agreement was for the students to pay 80% of all the routes and administration to pay 20%. Then in 2016, the Canton route came along because of the student demand. So the students funded that 100%. So the numbers you're seeing that um, part of the agreement now is that is 80% for all the routes and 100% for the Canton route. And then the administration covers the 20% for the remaining three routes, which is the Biopark Medical, Federal Hill, and Mount Vernon. Then we get into the biopark makes a contribution of $15,000. And you can see now that currently we're in a deficit. 
The only thing that is saving us now to be able to pay the deficits because the students have um, denied some of the fee increases, at least the necessary fee increases, is that we have a surplus from when the Canton route got implemented late, as well as we were trying to build up a new model so that there would be monies to have for uh, transferring in new vehicles. So you can see this model here has no funds available for the replacement of the vehicles. Currently, student fees are 189 full-time and 94.50 part-time. And again, as Don alluded to, the service ends in August 2019. And just before we get off this page, um, something you should note that's not here. We have many faculty and staff riding the shuttle service, and you noted the percentage of faculty and staff on the other page. They are currently not making a contribution toward the cost of the shuttle service. And through using used shuttle buses, there's a lot of maintenance, a lot of breakdown that also drives the cost of this operation up that you can't tell by just looking at the revenue sources. So again, this is the current model here. So this would be the proposed contractor option as far as the existing routes and the existing hours, and that's Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to midnight. You can see their number comes in at 1.173. And again, this proposal here was given for one year, and they kind of forewarned us that the number will go up. I'm not sure why. Oh, I'm sorry, because of the mistake. Because they actually made a mistake in their numbers, so they're willing to honor it this one year only. Good question. So here is a proposal that has the existing routes are the, as they are, minus the biopark route. Because as I mentioned before, the biopark is the least ridden route. You can see the price drops. And again, all the proposals, I don't have to say this, were given for one year. This is something we also wanted to present. So this is the reduced hours. You may remember when I went back to the shuttle ridership with the bell curve. So this covers Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 11 a.m., and then again, 3 p.m. and 11 p.m. You heard Dawn alluded to earlier that some of this information was changed as part of the focus groups. Originally, we had it around 9 or 10 o'clock, and because of the Monday night and other, law, uh, other nighttime classes at the law school and the school of social work, it was adjusted to 11 p.m. So that's where we came up with that time. And we have another option, which is the same thing, minus the bio part. Again, to go back, that was the least ridden route. And you can see the price drops even more. So these are some important points as far as some of the data that we uh, collected and some of the financial situations, uh, scenarios that we presented. There's 6% student population that ride the shuttle. The cost given for the shuttle, as I proposed, or as I mentioned earlier, is for one year and cost will increase. Some people had asked us to look into the Lyft and Uber model, because there's universities that are doing that. We did that, they're just not cost effective, given our numbers. We figured we'd run out of money in about three to four months, unfortunately. <coughs> so with that, we wanted to kind of, do you want to add something? Or do you want to yeah, I want to add something. The other reason why we're going to have to go out and that that price is only good for a year is with state procurement, you have specific rules about how you can procure certain services. So we were actually able to get access to the contract that we're talk talking to you about today through Montgomery College, Junior College, Junior College and they actually had a five-year agreement in place with this particular vendor, and this is the last year of that agreement. So they'll either have to go out for with a new RFP request for proposals or we will so that's another reason why this price that we're seeing is only good for a year what we understand is the vendor that we're speaking with really wants our business and hopefully we would when we do an RFP process we would see favorable responses at that time also so with that said this is your opportunity to share with us your reaction to what you've seen. And we can put anything you need to back on the slide. And there are people around the room that have microphones, so I hope uh, you'll take advantage of this opportunity to provide feedback. Who wants to go first? Uh, hello, uh, thanks for having this uh, information session. There's a lot of good options, I think. Um, I had a couple questions, but I'll start with one. 
Are you guys looking into uh, instituting a fee, kind of like a student fee, but for the administrative faculty that are also using the shuttle? So, if I understand your, correct, your question correctly, you're asking about the student fee versus the faculty and staff? Yeah, correct. Okay. The, the other uh, we are set of the users that are not currently paying. Correct. We are looking into the possibility of creating a yearly pass for the faculty and staff and charging them. Obviously, once we get our prices set, we'd be able to figure out what the right student uh, fee should be. I don't want to make any promises off the bat because, as I said, these numbers are only good for one year. Um, but certainly anything that came in to make the program uh, financially successful, we would try to give back whatever we could to the students. So yes, um, just to, so yes, um, we want to make sure that the students are not subsidizing the rides for faculty and staff, so there would be some contribution. And for any staff or faculty in the room, the reason why it would need to be a commitment for the year is because when we say we're buying equipment based on this ridership, we're locked into a co contract based on that ridership. And if you were to say you're going to ride this month, but not next month, we can't give them back part of a bus and say, charge us less. So that's the reason we would have to have a, a long-term commitment from riders. Uh, a follow-up question on the student fees. Uh, do you guys uh, have the information as to what the breakdown of that fee is and how much of it goes towards the shuttle and um, whether or not uh, that breakdown uh, it's, I'm just thinking uh, moving forward when students have the potential to vote for a proportional increase in that fee in future years, if there's information on how much goes to the shuttle versus the other student fees. So I can speak that the current student transportation fee, 100% of it goes to the shuttle. That was that $900,000 number that I alluded. So I can tell you there's no other money. It's actually, as I mentioned, parking is a big contributor both from a financial standpoint and a resource standpoint. So the $189 that you pay a year is a separate, or a semester a year, I can't remember. That's a separate fee from your other student fees. Oh, sorry, so I just got here, because um, I've got other commitments. Um, a couple of things I want to say. Um, first is, I don't know how that 6% data was collected because 6% um, of the population of UMB uses the shuttle bus because I've got on there countless times and I've forgotten to tap the screen and no one has said anything to me. So I just wanted to put that out there. And also, there's not a huge amount of people here and that's not because we don't care. I've had to jiggle things around to be able to come here and both of these forums that you guys have put forward have both been on Mondays. And next Monday, I can't get out of being with another commitment. So I just wanted to get that clear. Um, and to this guy's point about getting faculty to pay, I'm faculty, I've spoken to loads of faculty who use the shuttle bus, and this is one thing that we wish had been put forward before that email was sent out, because I would gladly pay to make sure that the UMB um, students particularly, and postdocs, that they're gonna be safe in Baltimore City. So, and lots of faculty I've spoken to have said the same thing. I have no issue, you know, contributing to keep this shuttle bus service running, as a lot of faculty don't either. So it's a good thing. So you may have come in late. Yeah, because I got lots of things going on. So. Understand. Um, what was said in the beginning is there is no intention to eliminate the service, and just from your comments, um, that may be what you thought this was about. This session is really about focusing on what the alternatives are. And um, I'm glad to hear you say that you've talked to other faculty and staff about being able to provide um, a fee or a, a price for paying the service. Well, I think this is truly, really, really all about how do we provide transportation to people who have come to campus as students and the students that mainly started as and they wanted to live someplace else. And they're counting on this to be able to get to and from campus. The model that we had in place was a faulty model. It was running a deficit, so this has given us an opportunity to say, how can we do this and do it smartly? And provide, I'm thinking, a better letter of service than you actually had before. Okay, but just to follow up on that, the email that we were all sent a few months ago, it was unnecessarily alarmist. It just said, the shuttle service is ending this summer. We don't have anything in place. We'll sort something out, don't worry. I think that was really a wrong way to go about it because so many people panicked after we got that email. 
understood. And again, I know you were late, but I apologize for that in the beginning. So we're good. Other questions? And wait, I have to say, this woman here has been trying to get her hand in the air. So can you get her? Thank you. I am probably not going to ever get the shuttle again because I, I work at the hospital, at uh, PCT. Not a student. Oh, faculty. Sorry. Um, if it would make any difference, as if it would help for employees to make a contribution, a yearly contribution to keep your keep the shuttle running, it would be safe for all of us. That's good to hear. So that is one of the models, and we are also we're also looking at opening up pregnant moms to the hospital. That if the hospital staff wanted to purchase one of those yearly passes as well, we obviously have to make sure we have enough seats for our students and our staff first. But we would certainly be looking into that as well. Hi, how are you? Um, so I want to actually talk a little bit about those models that you put in place, those different ideas. Um, well, in the past, I believe there's only been one backup bus, so now there's going to be two. So I'm concerned that adding another bus from a new vendor, which I'm hoping will be a more reliable bus system that isn't breaking down all the time, will need one bus like we've had in the past, we won't need two buses. So why are we factoring in two in this case? So that's a good question. We did follow up with the vendor on that. Under the College Park model, we had a spare driver also because of the proximity between here and College Park. Under the contractor model, there will not be an extra body sitting there, so that's why they're bringing in two shuttles. When we asked them to take one out, there was no price difference. So they're kind of just, if you will, giving it to us to sit on our campus. So and that is another important point. Under the contractor model, the buses will be here in Baltimore and won't be down in College Park. So when it comes to a weather, uh, weather related uh, delay or opening, will be affected by the Baltimore weather, not necessarily the College Park weather. So I hope that answers your question. Um, just, uh, I'd like to add to that. This vendor is uh, really great with customer service, and they do not operate this type of model without having two backups because of the type of business model that they have. They want to ensure that there's appropriate number of buses. So that was a really um, important factor that they stressed during our meetings with them. So just want to also explain why that's not a cost difference for them. That's just how they operate their business. And my second question is kind of going back to some of the things that have been mentioned regarding the student fees. Um, and I know we've talked at length about this. Um, so what I'm wondering now is, is the agreement that we've originally had where students are paying 80 percent and the administration paying 20, is that going to stand if we are switching our business model? Because as you've heard so far, faculty and staff are willing to pay. So these are estimates based on what's previously been done. Are we going to have to maybe change based on how many passes? So what we'll do at that point is we will look and determine what, what is the possibility in terms of the student fee? Um, what would we do with faculty and staff? My guess is that the biopark will no longer contribute their $15,000 if we're not going to run a bus over there. So we'll figure all of that out. Um, again, we are not making any promises. There probably won't be any changes to the fees for this first year because we don't know what to expect the second year. I think that's the best way to say it. I don't see with faculty contributing that student fees will go up at all. Yeah, my, my concern with this is that I feel that the students now, that they're having their voice heard, that these prices should reflect ridership. And as we've seen, if students have been contributing 80%, only 53% of the riders are students, then it should be reflective of that. We'll have to, we'll have to look and see how the financial model works. Um, because. I wonder, and I don't know the numbers because we haven't done the numbers, but if we did in fact change that, um, we could potentially be charging faculty and staff a number that really is cost prohibitive, which means they wouldn't have, we wouldn't have their support in terms of the number of buses we would need to run 
and then the cost will fall 100% back on students. So we have to we have to balance it all out and look at what um, an affordable rate would be. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I actually just had um, sort of a, a specific question about the buses themselves um, because I've noticed that there are some of the full size buses and some of the smaller ones. Um, I was a little unclear on with the new vendor if these were going to be all different buses than the current ones and if so what size buses what the difference in price was because I didn't know like if yeah if there's not enough people to like fill one of the full size buses is it more cost effective to use the smaller ones and is that an option? Um, Tony doesn't mind. Do you have a little more information on the makes of model? testing um, the cost of the the new buses are in the, the total cost um, it's mentioned the one million um, the buses that uh, rushing limo has is totally different than what we're using um, if you guys notice we use the freight liners and we use the Gillix it will be a different model bus um, it will still have the same capacity so we don't have to be concerned about um, overfilling of the, of the bus as well but it will be a different model bus. Um, I haven't seen the, the bus as of yet. So once a decision is made, then we'll get an opportunity to uh, look at the bus and, and see exactly the model, et cetera. So the rest of has made, rest of has made it clear to us that the buses they're going to use are not much smaller than the bigger uh, Gillick buses that we're using as far as the number of passengers that could ride. So to kind, of, to kind of answer your question, the freight liners were the smaller buses. The Gillick's is a bigger one. As far as dropping down to a smaller bus for the smaller route, Reston's bidding this off of buying new equipment for the future for us. So it's going to be one bus that they're going to use. But do we know if it's going to be more cost effective to get smaller buses? Like, is that. We, like, we would use, if I can add something, um, with this particular vendor, what they're going to be doing during this year that we're, they're going to be operating this bus, they're going to look at exact counts of how many people go on and off at each station, and then we'll actually set up their recommendations of what size buses would make sense for going forward. So that's something that, and then, and the stops as well. They would evaluate the stops and say, you know, we're really seeing a lot of people getting off here, but no one really getting off on these stops. So they will be doing a kind of a comprehensive look at how we run, you know, but just rest assured that it will be taken into consideration in the appropriate size buses, but just going to small buses would create some potential issues for the busy times because those we know at times fill up. So that's why we wanted to start off with something that wasn't much different than the larger buses that we have right now, and then we can really look at it and see what makes sense for the future during this one year period of time. So something that came up in one of the models uh, was the possibility of getting rid of the biopark route and also cutting back hours. I think that was model, I want to say C, maybe not. There you go. Um, okay. So I was wondering, would it be possible to do um, one and not the other? Because I'm sure that there are people who are reliant on the biopark route. We keep all the routes and just cut back the hours. Okay, great. Thanks. Ridership is critically important, and we're doing data-driven decisions. What this is saying is during the week that we did our count, 0.8 people rode this bus at 6 o'clock. 4.4 people rode the bus at 9 o'clock. So it's not cost effective to ride a bus on this particular, to have a bus on this particular route. And there are alternatives for people who have one cards and UMMC passes because the medical center runs a bus to Midtown, and we have our safe ride service that will take people um, in the evening and early in the mornings from campus 
to west of MLK and back. So we're trying to find, we're not gonna have a perfect scenario that answers everybody's needs. So what we're trying to do is compromise and come up with the most cost-effective and customer-centered program that we can. Did that help you at all? So what I'm saying is that this information is driving the slide, go to the slide where we crossed out Biopark. Because of that information, we're, we're leaning toward cutting that route out. And the hours, it just doesn't seem like, again, we're not gonna be able to answer, have an answer for everybody's needs, but in the middle of the day when buses are riding with a couple of people on them, it's just not, it doesn't seem like we're doing our fiduciary responsibility to have buses running during that time. By doing both of these changes, it's more cost effective and at the end of the day, hopefully, everybody will be able to share in that. Um, hi, I was wondering if we get rid of Biopark, um, are the other three routes gonna stay the same with this vendor? Like all the stops will be the same for all three routes? At least for the first yes. yes. um, The first year, yes. yes. Um, and then, the, like I mentioned, the vendor will be looking at it and evaluating it and making recommendations. So, but absolutely the same stops for all of the other. Would that be true the whole year? Or would it, it for a whole year. Okay. Um, uh, so I was wondering, uh, when will you know for sure that we can go with the new vendor? And are there uh, backup options or alternatives in case that doesn't go through? We know we can go with the new vendor. They're just waiting for us to say, this is what we want. So we will be making our decision between May 6th and May 15th, but we want to give the campus the opportunity. Um, that's what we're having in the town halls, to give us feedback. Are there anything that you all see, like the students helped us with the time last week? They, they pointed out that the times didn't work for social work and law school in terms of the nighttime departure. So are there things like that that you can share with us that are problematic that would cause us to say, okay, we need to tweak this some more? I actually have a question with regards to time. So I really like that all the proposed options have 6 a.m. as an actual option. Um, as far as I know now, at least throughout I take, all of them definitely do not leave at 6 a.m. I mean, the earliest I can get to campus is 7.45. Um, I was wondering if this is a true 6 a.m. leave, and like if that's something that's really like, improved upon with this new plan. Which route did you ride? 7.04. Okay, Ken leaves at 6.40. Yeah, so, yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, it's, it's according to the schedule model. Yeah. Ken was, uh, was designed leave at 6.40 because it's our longest route. Mm -hmm. So it takes an hour, maybe an hour, 15 minutes to do the complete route. So in order to do that, in order to have the drivers back by 12 midnight, we had to adjust the schedule, meaning it starts later in order for it to complete the route at the same time everyone needs to go back to the So that's why it starts at But we're not going back, this whole new thing is not going back to College Park, right? Correct. Well, so it, like, I'm asking like, if in this improved new shuttle, because we're not going back to College Park, will it actually be 6 a.m. in that early? We will look at it, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this new vendor will be looking at it, and we'll be trying to optimize service as much as possible and see what the ridership's like and then put a plan together that makes sense while they're operating it during this year. So we will be getting a lot of information and feedback from them based on data. They have a, the basic GPS and then like a card reader software and it's, they even have real, I believe real time with, it's different than next bus. So their technology is really advanced and they're used to planning these things. So they will be able to maximize and optimize the service pickups and start times. And then of course we will work with campus to make sure that the times work for the classes that start and end as much as possible. But again, it has to also do with the route itself, but we'll do the best we can with this vendor to meet needs. So let me interrupt you for a second. Well, I think what I'm hearing your question is, when it says six o'clock there, does that mean that's when I will get to campus or is that the first stop? 
on the route. I understand it's like when the first stop is, but as far as I knew, that the first stop for the 7 of 4 was like 645, which is... I'm just curious, just by a show of hands, this is not going to be scientific, how many people need to get to campus like 6 o'clock in the morning? Well, for or I, as like a medical student, I can say like right now we're first years and we'll be second years, but once we're in our clinical years, we need to get to campus early to be in the hospital. So, I mean, All right. we will. Um, so I actually had a question about sort of long-term future. Have any of you ever looked into like green initiative grants? I know that in, we're, I know we're not like a, a government program specifically in terms of running a, a bus, but Howard County recently got a grant for like three RTA electric buses and um, long-term cost in terms of, you know, if we have new buses, maybe the upkeep isn't so bad, maybe the rides aren't so painful, <laughs> literally painful. Um, it's better for, you know, the environment, it's better for kind of our reputation as a campus, like is that something we might look into and maybe apply for a grant for? To answer your question, to date we have been so focused on trying to have it be financially sustainable that we have not done master long-term planning. But we're taking your comments down. I think uh, most of the people up here are green people and want to be sustainable, so it's things that we need to look into. So for the operating hours for this service, service D, Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 11 a.m., that doesn't take into account the school social work. We have classes that end, that go 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. So did you take into account all of the school's different class times? No, we didn't. We took into consideration where we had the, the peaks in our transportation. And if Bill Crockett were standing up here, I'm going to do my inner Bill Crockett. He would say when you get out of class that you hang around campus and you do things at the rec center or other things that will have you be more connected to campus because there is research that shows that that helps with student success. And again, the solution we come up with is not going to make everybody 100% happy. It just will not. And what was, I know that May 6 through 15 is the deciding week for this vendor. What was the main determinant of deciding this vendor? You haven't been talking about plural vendors, so has there been a bidding process? If I can uh, add, uh, Don talked about the procurement process because we're a state entity, and uh, we are able to piggyback off of a, another contract with another campus that's also a state entity, which is Montgomery College. So that's how we're able to even have this opportunity. If we didn't have that, we would not have a shuttle service at least for another nine months or so because that's how long the RFP process would take so that we could go through the proper channels and meet the state and you know, University of Maryland system rules that are governed so that we can get a procurement. So this, we were lucky because we were able to piggyback off of this. We didn't have a lot of options because that's the only one that we were able to find and has been very willing to work with us. So it was great that we have this opportunity. If not, we'd have to go out to RFB and we, unfortunately we would not have a shuttle service when the shuttle service stopped. So the good news is that this vendor is available for us because we're working within the procurement rules. Or the other option would have been to stay with College Park and charge everybody more. And then just to follow up on Don's comment, at the same time that we uh, figure out what we're doing with this vendor, we will also be putting out our own RFP, which the current vendor has more than willing, uh, willingfulness said that they would like to bid as well. So that has to go simultaneous to make sure that there's not a gap the next time around either. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, so <clears throat> I just wanted to, to clarify something. So as I understand it, the new contract begins May 2019 and lasts, or August 2019, yes. and lasts one year. No, that's not true. Actually, it only is good until June because of the way the financial year yeah. runs, so because of the contract we're piggybacking off of. Till June 2020, and it will for sure include one of these proposed plans. Yes. And no 
Is there going to be an, an annual fee or card for staff and faculty, or is that going to be pursued in, after June 2020? With the beginning of the fiscal year, everything has to be about communication and advance notice. So I would think at this point, we would have enough time to tell faculty and staff that they can anticipate that there would be an annual agreement that we would do a monthly um, withdrawal, payroll withdrawal for. So yes, when we start the new fiscal year, I anticipate we would be starting with that additional assistance and covering costs from faculty and staff. Okay, and so what are you thinking about in terms of what that fee will be in dollar terms? So, we know that we currently charge $45 um, for a MTA pass for faculty and staff. Um, as I was explaining earlier, we need to take all the costs into consideration. This is just the direct cost to the operator. It doesn't include any overhead. It doesn't include the fact that we need to have reserves. That's the smart fiscal thing to do when you're running a business. And so we want to balance all of that out and, and determine finally what the cost will be in time to be able to communicate that to people. One more quick question for it. So uh, you have a deficit of about 60K at the moment, but if you start charging staff to the fact, back to the staff, sorry, I said before. Uh, have you thought about the condition at which point you might actually have a positive uh, net? And so what might you do with that money? So yes, we have. And please don't forget that we know that these prices are good for a year. And so we need to really get through the RFP process and know what our costs are going to be after that point in time to know what surpluses are available. If they are, I don't know if you heard Robert said that the vendor made a mistake in the, in the numbers that they provided us, but they are holding to that for this year. So we have to go through that process and look at the numbers at that point to be able to say, yes, there is a surplus, no, there isn't a surplus, and if there is a surplus, what will we do with it? Okay, so... Um, Did that answer your question? I'm just going to quickly, so you guys are going to work out with these new vendors this next year, which model you're going to go with. Is that correct? You're going to collect data over the next 12 months? Or did I misunderstand? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to the vendor and say, this is the scope of work we want you to provide. We've given you the different options. We have options we're leaning toward. We were trying to get some insight from you all if there was an, uh, a model that the campus was leaning toward also. And once we decide between May 6th and 15th, then we're gonna to go to them and say, this is the service we want you to provide to our campus between now and June 30th. 2020. Starting, yes, June 2020. Okay, because just to my earlier point, um, I use the Federal Hill route, and so many times the bus will just go offline. This is why I was saying I don't know where the 6% comes from because Sometimes I just didn't, I got on the bus, I didn't tap the screen. Sometimes I just ended up walking because it would go offline. Um, the guy had to sit, or the girl, had to sit for maybe five, ten minutes um, by the science center. Sometimes they adhered to the schedule, sometimes they didn't. So you'd be waiting for the bus, you just missed it, even though it shouldn't have come yet. So that's just where I'm, everyone's noting, that's where I was concerned about how all this data has been collected. So I just wanted to see how that was going to be take into account moving forward with these new vendors. If you're thinking about changing the model, when you're going to have, uh, what sort of hours you're going to use. So I think maybe that is something that should be looked at continuously, particularly with these, this new vendor, and maybe things could be revised starting July 2021. We, 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 I didn't know that you guys were collecting information either. I, I didn't know why I was being told to tap the screen. I just did as I was told. If, if I knew that you were collecting data for this, then I would have tapped that. I would have tapped that as many. I would have got on, got off. So anyway, so, that's so, my question. So let me go back. Tapping in and tapping out five weeks ago wouldn't have mattered to this data. We had a specific week um, that we we hired people to sit on the bus and collect this data. So this is data that we firmly believe that we can trust. 
I will point out that one of the focus groups said, okay, but, I'm trying to remember how it was, the fact that you don't have shuttles that are convenient for law school students and social work students at the end of the evening, you're probably missing a lot of potential ridership that doesn't show in the data. So we took qualitative input and added it to the quantitative input to say, oh, okay, so then let's change the, the routes toward the end of the night. And part of what we want to be able to do is to make sure that those routes are scheduled so that people can end class at 9 o'clock, not have to do a 50-yard dash to get to the bus and be able to get to the bus conveniently. Same thing with law school students who get out at 9.30. So there's going to be changes that are made. So I'm not tracking with you when you say don't change things until 2021. We don't have a choice but to change um, the operation at this point. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, I'm talking about maybe there'll be a change again in 2021. Oh, so yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, one of the things that the vendor brings to the table that we didn't have with College Park is this is their business, and they're going to provide us those services and recommendations after they have experience that says, okay, you got two, two bus stops, one block apart. I picked up 10 people on this stop and one person on this stop. You probably could improve your overhead time if you just had one stop in this space. They're going to look at, are the buses the right size? So this is, I really look at this as a blessing in the size. It gives us an opportunity to go back to the shuttle services we've been providing and say, how can we do it best and cost effective? So I just want to ask a couple of us are wondering the same thing, kind of what that gentleman was saying earlier. Um, well, one, are the drivers also like included with the company? Is there going to be a change in drivers with the buses coming up? This upcoming year? The bus drivers were College Park right. related. We're going to have bus drivers that are going to be hired by the right. new vendor. Right. So one thing I also want to talk on what he was saying, like the week you guys took it, like what we have to like actually scan our cards, like the buses aren't always consistent. Sometimes the app doesn't work or sometimes they come early, a couple minutes. So like I can tell you from experience, the same week that you guys were scanning, I missed the bus one day because it was early. Um, so again, I want to add on that I don't think these values are necessarily accurate to the most part. Um, and like you were saying earlier, like it's not necessarily the most convenient stops. Again, if you include more hours, I think that would change a lot. Um, and then one last question. I think she was kind of asking that earlier and it's been hit multiple times. If you are including the uh, faculty fees, like you said, you have enough time to probably include this in the upcoming year. For the people who are riding like in Biopark in the back, would you be able to keep that bus for them as well if you're introducing those new fees? Because again, you guys said roughly 50% of the bus riders are faculty and multiple people today have said they're more than willing to pay. So would you be able to like eliminate or avoid cutting those rides for people? So, again, I have a fiduciary responsibility to do things that provide great service and that spends the state students' dollars um, effectively. The ridership that we are seeing on the Biopark bio right, route right now is not cost effective. We could probably get those people through the escort, or not the escort, but the safe ride over to the Biopark a lot more cost effective is and still like 15, i'm sorry is that like factoring in that they're paying 15,000 when you say factoring in that 15,000 i'm not sure i'm not talking about revenue so, so okay even if it was factoring in the 15,000 that's money that the bio park could be spending on something else while we still provide a great service to people to get across um mlk in a more cost-effective manner and allow them to spend $15,000 on something else that is a strategic priority for them. I don't want to just spend money because we have it. It's about spending it on the right things in a cost-effective, cost responsible manner. Okay. I just wanted to echo, again, like the inconsistencies and unreliable, 
just really unreliableness of the buses. I used to take it a lot more, and then it just became consistently harder to use um, with my schedule. But I'd also just like to ask if there's, you, you keep referencing the safe rides. Has there been any discussion with uh, the police service on that note? Because I've asked for um, a walking escort from the law school late at night up to the Lexington Market Garage, and it's taken them 45 minutes to an hour to come and come to walk me, and that's also just a huge waste of my time as well. Are you currently finding that to be the case? I haven't tried recently. Okay, so we have changed our model for safe walk also. We are putting more security guards on that versus sworn police officers. Security guards can get free a little bit more. So we are trying our best to improve our service in that respect. And yes, we've talked to police because police is part of the administration and finance family. Okay, great. I just I just wanted to make sure that whatever the whatever you're relying on is uh, also, we, we've checked um, on the shuttle from the UMMC that will go to Midtown. We know that that is available to our campus community if you have the correct IDs that say that you have business up there. And um, we know that we can provide the service for the safe ride. And then, let me follow up on your uh, next bus comment about the service being unreliable. When we spoke to this vendor, they're very aware of the next bus issue. That's why they don't use them. They use another one that they've uh, affirmed to us that is much more reliable and they're much more satisfied with. Love it. Which app do you remember? Do you remember what app they use? Yeah, I know. It sounds like you guys are excited. Do you remember the app they use? I don't remember the name. I don't remember the name. But, but the prediction uh, application is 100% better than the next one. We understand you guys, next bus predictions are really not that good. They'll say the bus is coming, next thing you know it gets off the line. That's because the next bus is an antiquated system. Now the new uh, wave system as far as tracking is concerned is much better. And the app that uh, Russ and Limber will be using is going to be 100% better. Um, wow, I'm loud. Um, I just, it sounds like you guys are excited about this, the possibilities of this new um, contract. Uh, one thing that I just want to sort of put a little bit of airtime to is, is there a way, it sounds like, uh, to incentivize safety for the drivers. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that and say that uh, we have potential to improve on the safety of those drivers. The end. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> Hello. Um, so you said that uh, the during the term, you took the uh, statistics of who was riding the shuttle, is that correct? You said it was during midterm week that you yes. just, okay. I just don't think it's a very representative week. Um, typically, I know uh, me and other students stay the shuttle, stay later on campus than the shuttle even runs, so that's not a great week to even take those stats in the first place. Um, I would also get to campus before six and study more, so I just think that's a really bad week in general. Um, not a really representative week of the whole semester. Um, also, I know that for my, uh, in pharmacy school, we have many classes that do end within that 11 to 3 break, and I typically do not. Um, hang out on campus and I had success there, so I was going home and studying as well. So I just don't think that's also very beneficial for everybody. But I understand you can't do everything. I just wanted to make my point known. So. Thank you. And um, we're a big campus. Everybody's going to have different opinions about different things. Whatever week we would have chosen, someone would have told us that was a bad week because. So we honestly and very transparently tried to do the best job we could at collecting information. Having this data is better than having no data at all. Um, well, Tom, one thing to add to that, they looked at you, someone talked about that punch system. As it was mentioned earlier with the punch system, they picked that week because they looked at previous years where people punched in, and that was the busiest week. So they also looked at previous data to pick the week of the highest ridership to be as representative as possible. So we used the term midterm week, but it wasn't the midterm for everyone. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for, for um, it sounds like you put a lot of thought into this and a lot of work into it. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I have a question about um, the funding sources. It seems like there's not that much contributed from the university 
like administrative or parking and transport fund. <coughs> and I'm wondering if that's been discussed as a possibility to increase that contribution. I'm a staff member and I'm willing to contribute as staff, but I really think that our university should be um, putting a little more money into this as well. And I'm sorry I'm talking for Robert, but <laughs> um, so parking is a whole nother animal that when you talk about all of the many garages we have on campus and a campus that has parking garages versus surface parking lots, it is much more expensive to maintain those, those parking garages and that parking operation. So I hear what you're saying, but parking has to make sure that it is dealing with all of the parking's issues. Um, That's, that, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I'm somebody who needs to have my flexibility. I would never ride a shuttle just because I'm in and out all day. It, having a better parking. And it's really sad that somebody would never ride shuttles personally. I'm sorry. I just have to go with my schedule and I just... I guess I'm not sure quite where you got that conclusion. Um, parking, parking, parking is also a service for all those students that come and park the cars here who don't use the shuttle service. Parking is also a service for faculty and staff. We've got multiple services because people have multiple preferences. And how much money are they paying for the? How much is parking? And We can have an offline conversation and we can go through all the different things that we're doing around the zip cars and the bike cages and, and all those things, but it really does take us down a path that's unrelated to changing our vendor right here and right now. Not at this time. I've served on the student fees advisory board for the last uh, three years, so I have gotten a lot of presentations from parking and transportation. I understand how expensive the shuttle was and how much money we've had to put into it. I also met with the parking and transportation consultant when they came, and as much as I would love to keep Biopark for the people that um, ride Biopark, it even months ago before this was a thing, um, like before this was a thing, um, the Biopark route was the lowest um, lowest ridership. ridership. Um, so, and I have used the Safe Ride program since they've gotten the new vans and since they, um, the new police chief who is a fantastic human, and if you email her with any concerns, like, she emails you back, like, it's fantastic. Um, so I have started using the Safe Ride program again um, and had a great time, with, not a great time, but like, you know, a good experience. Um, so. I guess my suggestion, I'm not going to comment on the timings just because I'm a graduate student. I live here. Like, I, I am in the lab all the time, so I take the shuttle, I don't take the shuttle. Um, but I guess I would comment on for money's sake and everything else, and because we have the Safe Ride program with more vans and they're way more reliable than they used to be, that my suggestion would be to get rid of Biopark. And I know that there are some people who ride Biopark and I'm not trying to take away from them, but the Safe Ride program has been so much faster and so much more reliable that if you're just trying to go across MLK, there are there is a viable option, is what I'm saying. Different than like if you're trying to get to Canton, um, Fed Hill, not for them. So, thank you. Thank you. We are at 5 o'clock. Um, if there's anybody that's just dying to ask one more question, we'll take it, but that would be it. Thank you again for coming out and sharing your time and your comments with us. We appreciate it. Thank you.